Hello and welcome back to season two of Practical Alchemy in collaboration with Latinas Who Meditate. My name is Natalie, I am your host, and today I have the honor and privilege of sitting down with Christine Olivia, who is just somebody that I truly admire in this space. She's a modern medicine woman of Mayan descent, a mystic, a facilitator, a guide, and an indigenous storyteller. Her passion is to remind people of their inner truth, innate magic, and ancestral roots, as well as their own intuitive wisdom. And Christine, thank you so much for taking time out. I know that you're currently in Guatemala and San Marcos, and so I feel so privileged that we get to tap into that magic that you're steeping in as we speak. And so thank you for being here. It's so beautiful to be here. It's such a blessing to share with you. Thank you for having me. Of of course, of course. I am so excited to hear more about your story, about everything that you're learning. And I would love to start at the beginning. I, I think this is probably going to be a pretty loaded question for you. So whatever your mm -hmm. heart resonant to, to take it, uh, feel free. But I want to start at the beginning of your spiritual journey. I'm curious, did you have a moment in life where there was this big shift to dive into the work that you do today? Or have you kind of always been on this path since you were a little girl? That's a lovely question. And I think that, you know, we may not know it, but this path is calling to us. I think we're here to evolve and to love unconditionally. And even if we don't hear that call in this lifetime, we may hear it in another. But it, it was always calling to me. So as a child, I was really um, in tune with my imagination, which supported me in connecting to the magic. And then as I grew, I forgot, like most humans do, I forgot my truth. I forgot, you know, how to connect with that part of me. I actually remember a really specific moment when I was about 12 years old. And just suddenly I couldn't play anymore like I used to. I remember I had dolls and it just wasn't feeling the same. There was something missing. And I remember putting that away and, and just like losing that ability to be in touch with my imagination and the magic. In my 20s is when I became incredibly disconnected to myself and to, to all parts of myself. I really turned to numbing and disassociating from the pain that I felt. There was so much trauma there and I was unable to support and cope and hold my nervous system and be with any of that pain that was there. And yet I had to hit rock bottom in order to change my life. It was actually when I was in an incredibly toxic relationship. And I remember being like on the bathroom floor, just on my knees and crying and be like, this is it. And eventually I shifted and started changing. I started going to yoga. And I think it's beautiful to note that yoga is such a beautiful entryway into spirituality, especially for those of us who are people of color because there is no trauma associated with it. There is no generational and generational trauma there. So for me, it was a nice entry point in. And while I was actually on my path and learning how to teach yoga, it was actually mystic yoga training in Bali of all places. <laughs> I was introduced to Guatemalan cacao, Mayan cacao from Guatemala and that brought me back to connection, it, like instantaneously. It was like, oh, here we are again. It brought me back to my heart. It brought me into connection with my lineage, my paternal lineage, especially because my father was from Guatemala. Um, so it brought me back to that connection with the ancestors and my ancestral plants, which changed absolutely everything. Bit by bit, I started coming back into learning about the ancestral ways, learning about my lineage. Then that brought me to Guatemala, which is was incredibly essential. I think connecting with the lands of your ancestors is hard to put into words how special that is, but there is something in that. And so I always recommend people to, to go back to their lands and see what medicine is there for them. Yeah, it's a little bit about that. Thank you. And I think it's so powerful. I think you said a couple of things that really stood out to me that 
at the age of 12, something shifted and, and you no longer were able to tap into that imagination. And it's so wild how when we enter the age of losing touch with what makes a child so innocent, that's when we start adopting all of the societal projections and and blockages and fears and programming and and we lose a sense of our true essence and so I love that you use the word remembrance because it's so true it's not something that's outside of us it's just coming home to something that's been innate within us but perhaps blocked and you wrote a book a child of magic which congratulations it looks beautiful I cannot wait to dive into it and read it myself And from what I know, it's based on your own journey of remembrance, which you just touched on a little bit. And I would love to hear more about that. What what does remembrance mean to you and how what did that look like and how has that unfolded for you in your life? Yes, the book is so beautiful and so fun and fun for the imagination. It's a fantasy fiction book that is based on my life, but also very whimsical and fun so that we can tap back into our imagination you know, adults need that support, especially to do so. So that's why I wrote the book. It was for adults, but to tap into the essence. And I want to note that actually that's the, my first book and I self-published that book. And I'm actually right now editing. That's why I'm, I'm here specifically. I came to Guatemala so that I can edit my, my book here. I just got my edits back from Hay House. And so I'm now rereading and doing my own edits for it. And that book is called Remember Your Roots as well. So the word remembrance means so much to me. And like you said, how we how we forget, I feel that's such an important thing to speak on. It's as if we came here so that we could forget to remember through our own unique process. So it's all about remembering for me, remembering all parts of ourselves, all parts of myself, so that I can love all of those parts and so that I can stop the fragmentation and come back into wholeness and oneness. Wow. Congratulations on your second book. That is so exciting. Yes, I know. I'm so, so excited. Yeah, that'll be out next summer. Stay tuned. (laughs) Okay. We will look out for it. And so this is, when was your first time going back to Guatemala, to the land of your roots? And then how has that journey been going back since? Yeah. And every time it is so different. The first time I came, I didn't know anybody. I And I didn't have any family. My father has passed away. My grandmother has passed away. We didn't know um, my father's father. So when I came, I just wanted to connect with the land and the ancestors of the land, which I got to do. And it was incredibly special. I remember crying. I was on the lake and I was on a boat and another boat passed by and it said Hernandez, which is my last name. And I just started bawling my eyes out like, thank you. Oh, I'm not alone. Yeah, just feeling that sense of like, oh, they're here. They're with me, right? And every time has been different. And I will say this time being here now has, I mean, they've all been so profound and they've just built upon each other. But it's very, very special this time because I got to spend time in Totonicopan, which is so far from from tourism. I got to spend time with my teachers, Nana Lu and Nana Maria and Tatatino and and they're incredible. I got to witness like a truly, truly authentic Mayan ceremony after Mayan ceremony. And yeah, I experienced so much magic and the initiations of being there with them and, and sitting in ceremony, you know, at 5 a.m. watching the sunrise and the fire burning and yeah, feeling those prayers and the blessings that came through. It's, it's been incredibly special. That's where I've been the first part of this trip. I've also been in Antigua, and now I'm in San Marcos, La Laguna, which most people know about. Yeah. Wow. That is so powerful that you've been able to connect with medicine people and true elders and be able to have those initiations. And it's it's important that people do so because these traditions, these cultures, they are endangered right? They're at risk of being lost forever. And so people like yourself and other folks who feel called to connect with their ancestral roots and continue carrying that torch and that lineage is important now more than ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is why I see myself as a bridge to those beautiful ways. And 
I want to learn all of these beautiful things and share what I can to support other people. Because I think knowing that, that our ancestors used to work with these beautiful ways, um, you know, that will support us in coming back home to ourselves. The ways that they were connected and interconnected and knew that they were connected to all things, to nature, this kept them healthy, this kept them happy, this kept them in harmony in their world, right? Their inner worlds and, and in the world. And so we get to share that. We get to share that beautiful ancient knowledge and and go back pre-colonization really knowing that we have these beautiful roots. We have these beautiful ways that we get to revive and bring back. And I actually have an event coming up called The Revival, September 15th through 17th, where we will be literally reviving these ways and sharing all different, you know, diverse backgrounds and cultures and ways and really uplifting our beautiful ancestral stories and this beautiful magic. It's literally the event that the ancestors have been waiting for. So I'm really excited that I can share that with you as well before that happens. Wow. Yeah, we will be looking forward to that. And I'm sure this will be the first of many. Yes. And talking about ancestral ways, we touched on it a little bit earlier. And the medicine of the Mayan peoples, the plant medicine that they worked with, the heart opener that is cacao. I know that we both share this beautiful relationship with cacao, this beautiful reverence. And what has your relationship with cacao been like as you were reintroduced to it when you were in Bali out of all places? And now it's become such a big, big component and piece of, of your life and your medicine, and your offerings and your journey. Yeah, it's just, it's the most sweet and gentle plant medicine that is yet so profound. So it's so gentle, yet so powerful and potent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm so honored and so grateful that it came into my life and that it is one of my ancestral plants that I get to share. My journey with it has been so sweet, so beautiful. That's what helped me to connect back to who I truly was, back to my heart, my lineage. Like I said, it's helps me in so many different ways to feel more deeply into all parts of myself, into grief that I wasn't able to feel in the past, into so much gratitude, so much bliss and joy. I call cacao the grandmother, this grandmother spirit, and many people do because it is like that grandmother essence that holds you, right, with that unconditional love <laughs> that is just so sweet and so loving. I wrote my book with cacao, with the ritual of drinking cacao every day, every time. And so it was written in a ceremony, the first book, very wow. much channeled by her essence. Um, and yeah, I, I love sharing cacao in ceremony. I've created something called the Matyosh method. And Matyosh means thank you in Mayan. So it's this gratitude method and a beautiful way for us to get out of the head and into our hearts and connect, you know, with mind, body, and soul. And it's really beautiful and so sweet. And, you know, even if we're just drinking it, you know, simply and going about our day, it's still working on us. It has an intelligence. The plants have an intelligence of their own. So even if we're not consciously aware of it, it's already doing something because it has so many beautiful properties within it. But if we give ourselves the time and we sit with it presently and we're aware of what we're feeling and you know, just give ourselves um, that beautiful extra moment and time, you can really feel it doing something energetically with you and you can notice the shifts and changes that are happening a hundred percent. And I love how you you just lit up when we brought up cacao. Your whole energy just shifted. And I actually made a cup of cacao for our interview. And I don't know yeah, if I shared yeah. this with you in the beginning. I'm also of my descent. So my lineage is from El Salvador, right next to Guatemala. And mm -hmm. yeah, when you said the the spirit of cacao is very grandmotherly. I feel that. I actually will share my first ever journey with cacao. I went to a cacao ceremony about five years ago, and I had no idea what it even was, what I was about mm -hmm. to experience. And I had a full medicine journey. I was so surprised. I actually had my grandmother who had passed like three months prior 
come to me during that ceremony. And I just had this whole journey with the the matriarchs and the grandmothers of my lineage. And yeah, I think you you said it just right. Cacao is so sweet. It's so subtle and yet so potent and so powerful. I love that you shared. I don't usually share the journey that I have with others, but I will share because you shared yours. I journeyed with the jaguar, the black jaguar, and that's why I have such a deep connection connection to that spirit animal, and it, that's why it's also in the book. So yeah, when you read the book, you'll see. Um, wow. But that's so beautiful to know. I, I knew it. I kind of knew it, but I, I you didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's it's always beautiful. The work is is and should be an intimate and private thing, right? Especially when it relates to the spirits or the guides that you work with. And so thank you for sharing that. And I know that you've been sharing cacao and ceremony through the Maltiosh method. What is the Maltiosh method in your words and how did that unfold or come about? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I love this question. Yes. So Maltiosh method, the gratitude method is us drinking. It's quite simple. It's Mayan cacao, meditation, and movement, right? The three M's. And this allows us to get out of the head and come into the heart, to really come into the body, really, right? It's an embodiment medicine and embodiment practice. And it's working on all parts of ourselves, right? The cacao works on all dimensions. The meditation supports us with our minds, especially the movement, you know, supports our body. And in releasing, we'll usually shake to support in releasing and letting go, right? We tend to store a lot of trauma in the body and in the muscles and in the tissues. And, and when we shake, that supports us in releasing that energy. And then from there, we will move into to dance, into the expression of our inner child, into the expression of gratitude and what that looks like, allowing our dance to be a prayer. So it's it's very sweet. I wanted it to be accessible to all people, almost like a workout for mind, body, and soul. And so that's why I came up with this and wanted to, and, and have been sharing this with the world. That is so yeah. beautiful. I love that. I think we would be doing a disservice to cacao if we didn't touch on cacao, because I know that you carry so many wisdom codes when it relates to cacao. So I would love for you to share for the listeners if they've never experienced the beautiful medicine of cacao, why cacao is so sacred, how it can be used in ceremony, and perhaps some of the properties that make it so euphoric and powerful and heart opening. Mm. Yes, yes. So yes, people call the cacao a heart opener because it is medicine for their heart. Literally, it's supporting your heart health. In so many ways, there are so many different properties like the aromine that supports the brain, that supports us in energizing, getting energized, but not like that of caffeine where you kind of have that spike and then a crash. It's a lot more gentle on our nervous systems. You know, anandamide, which has the bliss molecule that supports us in feeling so euphoric. There are PAs, MAOs that support us in feeling so much bliss and so, yeah, blissed out basically, right? So it's also considered an aphrodisiac because it does get the blood pumping, the heart going. Um, yeah, it's so beautiful. So it's working in, you know, in the physical in that way where it's supporting us to feel really good on that level. And then there's a deeper level where, you know, we, it's supporting us in our, our spiritual evolution and, and shifting our consciousness as well. And this is a plant that has been used for thousands of years by the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Olmecs before them. So it's this beautiful plant that, you know, it's been passed down and, and it's been carried for so long. And for a while there, you know, in the Western world, at least we didn't know about it. We're learning about cacao ceremonies more now, but we had no idea. We only knew of chocolate right? And we had no clue that this is medicine when we have it in its pure form. But when we are having chocolate, it is stripped of all of those beautiful health benefits, all of those fat and living enzymes. And all you're left with is the, the flavor, really. But when you have cacao in its pure form, you can add things to it, of course. But when you retain the fats and all of the, the natural living enzymes, then you're having the medicine. 
And so naturally it is bitter, but what we can do and what I share a lot of recipes online is you can add natural sweetener to it. You can add some different butters to it, coconut milk, um, you know, spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, a little cayenne, all these lovely things to make it taste like a hot chocolate, but it's literally medicine for the heart and for the entire being of yourself. So yes. Oh, I love that. Do you have a mm-hmm. go-to recipe that you always make when you're when you don't have all of your kitchen and you just have a few items? Yes, yes. So the cacao, you can get it in a block paste, right? Chop it up and you're gonna use some of that like maybe two tablespoons, little cinnamon, little natural sweetener. You can use some coconut sugar. I like monk fruit sometimes, but I'll use a little bit of anything if there's there. And then coconut milk. It's like super, super simple, but it's also not just about the taste. It's knowing that this is like medicine. And so it's going to taste good, but it's going to feel incredibly good as well. Yes, 100%. I think what always blows my mind is that cacao, the way that we look at superfoods today, it's like, what makes it a superfood? Cacao literally has all of the proteins, fats, and amino acids that a human body needs. It's just Mm -hmm. like cacao is like, I am all that you need. (laughs) It's amazing. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And I think it's important to note, too, that it's not a psychedelic. A lot of people think it might be a psychedelic and hear plant medicine. But knowing just that it is consciousness shifting, you are going to feel different. It opens you up to feel more fully alive. That's an important thing to note as well. And so you said cacao opens you up. It makes you feel more fully alive, though it's not a psychedelic. It's still a plant medicine. Exactly. So it's consciousness shifting, but it's a gentle plant medicine. And that's why I love being an advocate for the gentle plants, especially cacao. And I also like to add that there's other you know, ancestral plants and plant medicines that we can work with that are also nourishing herbs and, you know, easy on the nervous system too, like the lavender, like there's the chamomile, there's the blue lotus, there's so many other plants. So looking into what are your ancestral plants is always a good idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I would love to shift gears a little bit and whatever you feel called to share, I would love to chat more about the Mayan Cosmovision, la Cosmovision Maya. I am in my own initiations with it, just in my personal level. And I know that you work with that system and those technologies a bit. And can you share with the listeners if maybe they've never heard of the Mayan Cosmovision, maybe we can start with what are the Mayan Nahuales? and what what they mean. Oh, so there's 20 different Nawales. Um, So I won't go over all of them, but I will go over (laughs) a couple. Go over mine. (laughs) There's 20 different Nawales. The mine calendar is a sacred calendar. And this is the calendar. It is a nine-month calendar, 260 days. And it contains the 20 Nawales and the 13 numbers. And when we combine that, we find our unique energy that we are born with specifically. The Nawales has... An energy, the numbers has an energy as well, um, but the Nawala is the the um, the one that has your specific energy that is the most potent of all, right? So the number has a little bit of an influence, but it's not as in- essential as the Nawala. So Nawal, my Nawal is Akpu. Akpu is is the sun, right? It's it's the most shamanic on the calendar, but that doesn't mean it's the most favorable. And that's because it means that you must go through the most difficult challenges in order to shine as brilliantly as the sun. I also have the number three. And three is more of an internal number, right? If you were to have the number one in your chart, one would be um, more about unity. Number two would be more about relationships. Number three is also more internal. Number four is a very balanced number. So all the numbers mean something different. And then all of the Nawalas mean something different as well. I have Ish in my chart and Ish represents the Jaguar. So they have different things that represent those energies. It's not always an animal. Like for me, I'm the sun. Ish also is the Jaguar. There's Tihaj. Tihaj is the night. And and all of these energies kind of support you to understand your, you know, your persona and also your dharma, understand who you are and what, you know, is going to be favorable for you, what is going to support you, like what you come in with, your personality, your traits, and also your disadvantages and the things that, 
you know, also are there on the other side of that. <laughs> so, yeah, there's so much there. When you get a reading, you would get a cross that explains your past, your present, and your future. And you hit your present, actually, at the age of about 26. And the way the calendar works is you move into your eldership once you hit that age of 26. And so I'm moving into Kanil, and Kanil is the corn. It's abundance. And so it's like, it's, it's, it's as if as, you know, I'm moving from challenges and shining now and coming into more abundance and things after the, the experiences and the lessons that I've learned, the things that I've experienced. That's for me. And everyone is so different, and they're not always so favorable and and shiny either right they're they're a lot more real it's not like astrology where it's kind of fluffy and everything just is so fun and exciting sometimes it's <laughs> like oh no we're gonna go through some challenges and it's gonna be really rough um <laughs> and it's not for a reason and then you have also on both sides you have the energies the feminine side and the masculine side to support you in knowing like your career and the energy around your career and your creativity as well. And then you have the influence of the year that you were born in. And you also have the, a little bit of an influence on the why you have that characteristic and that Nawal, which is called the Tresena, which has its own energy as well. So wow. it is it is quite com complex, but then when you break it down and it's a little bit more easier to, to digest, but it takes, it definitely takes time. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you for that breakdown. I love how effortless that was because this is ancient, ancient knowledge, ancient technology that has been used by the Mayans and I don't know, maybe thousands of years ago and is still so relevant today. I remember when I got my reading, I guess you could call it, I was blown away by the accuracy. And you're right, it wasn't all fluffy and, and you know, nice to hear. Some things were like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> true. And that's not a good trait. But, you know, it's like, it's real. It's super yes. real. And um, I know that you offer reading. So for those that are listening and are interested, I think on your website, you have a way to figure out your Nawales. So we'll link that for sure. And if you want to dive in deeper with Christine, it really is so, it's a blueprint, right? That you can utilize to better understand yourself and better navigate if you're going through things. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend just even getting to know your Nawales. And if you feel called to go deeper, it sounds like Christine, you're pretty, pretty well versed. <laughs> And I'm always a student. There is so much to learn. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And thank you for that breakdown. And so are different spirit animals linked with different components? Like for example, the jaguar is linked with ancestors, so on and so forth. So no, that's not, not specifically how it works. So each Noel has a different component or characteristic, you can say, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be with a spirit animal. So I that's, see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. And the ancestors is one that is also with the number of 13. So it's not necessarily always the Noel either. I see. I see. Yeah. I need to dive deeper into mine. What I know for sure is that my primary energetic blueprint is the feathered serpent, um, which huh? is, yeah, gun. Exactly. Oh, what's your number? Mm, I forget. I want to say it's three. Okay. But I could be totally off base. I have to look it up. Okay. So a lower number is a good thing because con is a very, it could be a very intense energy. And that means that you get to always work with your spiritual practice to keep you, you know, in line and walking this path in a good way because of the power that it holds. It can you know, be used for good or for bad. And so it's so beautiful to see, yeah, what the cons can do. Because my partner is a con as well. And he's an yeah. 11 con. So then the energy doesn't really, it can be really intense and so powerful. So you're like such a natural leader. And that means that you have to work through, yeah, the shadows and the other things and learn through that. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what I mean. When I learned and it was like all the shadow, I was like, oh God, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> right. And it's like, 
how else can we know how to truly be in the light unless we work through those those shadows in the darkness? Mm. Totally, a hundred percent. Well, thank you for that that debrief. And like I said, if you want to learn more, check out the link below. And as we wrap up, I always love to close with some practical alchemy, that being the name of the podcast. It's a lesson or a tool that can be practically implemented into somebody's life to create alchemy in their lives. And so as we close, could you leave our listeners with a simple yet impactful way for them to connect with their own ancestors that they can implement today? Mm, Absolutely. Such a beautiful, beautiful question. Work with cacao. So if you can't get ceremonial cacao, then for your first time, use the nibs that you have, that you use for your smoothies, whatever you can get, as pure as you can get it. And drink the cacao. And it's as simple as setting the intention and calling in your ancestors to begin with. The more you work with them, the more you open to them, you have that intention, the more you'll start to feel them. And maybe even create an altar and that can really support you as well. Mm-hmm. And what can an altar look like? Mm. So an altar can be as simple as having a nice cloth piece where you will place in your home that feels really safe and comfortable where you will come to every day to connect with the ancestors. It's as if they will know where to find you and there you will have sacred items and this will be almost like a portal and a place where you can commune with spirit and connect with the ancestors as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And Mm -hmm. Christine has so many beautiful offerings, as she mentioned, her workshop, as well as when the book comes out, we can't wait to see it. But if you want to connect with her deeper, we will link all the links in the bio. And then how can people further connect with you? Yeah, I'm on IG, Christine Olivia, which is C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-O-L-I-V-I-A underscore. And yeah, you can find all the things on there. I think that's the easiest way. My website's IamChristineOlivia.com as well. Thank you so much. And yeah, there's a free guide. I will put that link then there. I can give you the free guide so people can create their own ceremonies at home. Oh, beautiful. Yes, please do. That would be wonderful. Yay. Yay. Well, in true form, Matios, thank you for your time. Matios, sister, thank you. Thank you.